Well, good morning, everyone. I hope you all had a happy Thanksgiving, good times with family and friends. And our prayers go out to those who aren't with us today who are also still enjoying time with family and friends in celebration and blessing. We're going to be wrapping up our series this morning on living a focused life. Kind of review some concepts, step back and look at what is this life that Christ has called us into. So let's pray this morning as we open up as a body that we would be edified this morning, that God would be glorified, and that Christ would illuminate our way. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we have the privilege to gather together as your people. We pray that this morning you would use all facets of our time together to strengthen your body, that we may be in you as you are in the Father. Help us to glorify your name and draw deeper to yourself. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've given us, ask that you bless our time. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, everybody. Let's stand up. We're going to sing a few songs here. Let's put our hands together. We're going to start off with Psalm 37. Oh uh -huh. 
Okay, we're going to slow down just a little bit here. Let's sing a hymn.
This morning, we're reading from Colossians 3, verses 12 to 17. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and, if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Let's all uh, stand up and we can go around and greet everyone. And we'll give you a few minutes today.
test. Good morning. Welcome. I'll let you wrap up your conversation with each other there. So. We thought we'd give you an extra minute to say hello during the holiday season. Um, just a few announcements for you. Um, one is that our holiday service schedule is in your bulletin with uh, both Christmas and New Year's fall on Sundays uh, this year, on the 25th and the 1st. And we are having a Christmas Eve and a Christmas Day service and a New Year's Eve and a New Year's Day service, so those times and dates are there, uh, just for your uh, information. It, I really enjoy this time of year. I know a lot of, a lot of you are traveling and with family and able to relax a little bit, hopefully. And, uh, but it is, a, it is a time of year where we focus a little bit on how important relationship is. And I think Christians can have the opportunity to bring this message that people are important, relationships are important. And this is one of the things the Lord did at Christmas time is, is he was calling people back to himself and changing history because he cares about people. So, so be thinking about that, and, and, uh, and we are wrapping up our series today, and Chris is going to teach about uh, being in focus today. And we start a new series next week uh, about the truth about Christmas, different truths about Christmas and, and this time of the year. So, so with that, um, that's, the only, that's the announcements we had for you today. We're going to have Chris come up and, and finish our series today on being focused on the Lord. I brought a myriad of beverages with me, just in case my voice starts to go. Well, good morning, everyone. Again, it is good to be with you. Some of you may be aware that from time to time, I have been known to play guitar every now and then. So, one of the things that I do when I play guitar, though, is when I come across a chord that I don't like or is too complicated, I kind of cheat a little bit. Amen, <laughs> Kim. <laughs> and I move my fingers around in a different way to, like, avoid the chord, but still get the idea across. And I, I get away with it most of the time. I can play the note in the song, and the idea of the chord is communicated. But... If, let's say, one of the pianists come up, and let's say we're playing a B chord, like Robin or Nathan, and they play a B chord, because they are very well versed in music theory and know how to play their chords properly. When they play the proper B chord on top of my cheating B chord, you can tell a difference. At least I can when I'm up here. I'm like, ooh, I can tell I'm cheating. It's not that my note is necessarily wrong, but it's not full something is missing. And I think sometimes, for a new Christian, the foundations of Christianity are laid thus, in a similar way. You're a sinner. You're going to hell. But Jesus died for your sins. If you want to go to heaven instead, trust in Jesus Christ. Say this prayer. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with any of these statements. Something's missing. It's not quite the core of where the Christian life is at. And someone who is introduced in this way might think that, well, this is it. This is my ticket into heaven. I'm here to get fire insurance and go to a place. And the picture I want to paint this morning is rather a thriving Christian life as opposed to simply going to a place or avoiding another place and getting fire insurance. That there's something richer on the other side and within our faith. Who is this? Pinocchio. 
So this is a Disney movie just it re-released this year, like they redid it, and now there's a new reboot of Pinocchio this year. But the classic that came out in like 1940 from Disney is really, really well done. It's a simple story. It has a lot of spiritual and psychological significance and symbolism baked in, and it's a very good tale. In the story, Pinocchio, a puppet, has supernatural life given to him by a supernatural being. This is exciting to him, but it's not quite where he wants to be. He wants to be a real boy. He's got life in him, but he's not yet living. And most of the movie, he ends up making choices, though he wants the goal of being a real boy, that kind of push him away from that goal. He makes bad choices that kind of push him toward the object of being in an animate wooden toy more than a real person. And he doesn't get close to his goal or achieve it until he gives the ultimate sacrifice and shows his love and lays down his life for those dearest to him in the belly of a whale, no less. By then, by doing those things, he becomes a real boy. But for the bulk of the story, there's a gap between where he is and the life that he's being drawn to. We have been sitting for most of the series in Ephesians 5 as kind of a theme verse, Ephesians 5, 15 and 16. This should look pretty familiar. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. And as we conclude the series this morning, I want to kind of tie a bow on things by going to the verse that comes just before this one, Ephesians 5, 14. Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. There's a life that the Lord is drawing us to in our faith that is more akin to arising from the dead and being awoken from sleep than it is getting to a ticket to a destination. And if we can engage in that life and keep our eyes fixed on it, Christ will shine on us, whatever that means. The Bible is full of stories of the Lord calling his people into a rich life that he has prepared for them, and they quite don't know what to do with. Some examples. In Exodus 16, the Lord gives the Israelites the Sabbath. He introduces them to the concept. This is the story where the manna comes down from heaven, the daily bread that falls, and he says, hey, gather this bread every day. On the sixth day, gather twice as much bread, because on the seventh day, I want you all to rest. Enter into a solemn rest, and that's going to be holy. And the Israelites are like, oh, a seventh day, like, we could gather even more bread. And they're like trying to like work the system. And he's like, guys, stop. How long are you going to keep ignoring what I'm saying? I've, I've given you rest. Enter into it. In Psalm 81, also kind of in the Lord's voice, he laments, oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. It's kind of a, I don't know, heart-wrenching psalm to read in certain moments because it's the Lord for most of that theme is for, like saying hey if I had my I have my hand open the thing you need is right here why my people just need to take it why wouldn't they take it if you open your mouth I'll fill it with provision and wheat and honey but my people don't come to me and it's, it's very kind of mind-boggling but it's that same idea of a life that the Lord is drawing his people into that he's handed to them and that they don't take. Narrowing our focus a little bit more, we see the same theme show up in Luke, from Jesus in the New Testament. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And Jesus is saying and proclaiming like, hey, on the tail end of a speech that he's been giving, don't be anxious. Why are you so worried about these things? Like my father has literally given you an entire kingdom out of his good pleasure. Step into it. Don't fear. Last week, Mike read in his sermon from Colossians 3, and we actually read from Colossians this morning. I forgot we were going to do that, so it worked out very well. Colossians is a wonderful book that Paul writes about Christ's divine nature and our interactions with it. It's very fun to like just sit down and absorb. 
And the passage Mike read from last week was about setting our eyes on things above, where Christ is, because that's where our life is hidden. And that's a theme Paul touches on several times, including in the chapter beforehand, Colossians 2. And this is the verse we're going to sit on a little bit and come back to every now and then this morning. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. There's this claim here that the life that the Lord is drawing us into is found in Christ. We started that life by receiving him. And it says, just as you received Christ, so walk in him. Not just like him or beside him, but in him. Which is this very mysterious, supernatural thing that takes place for the bulk of the Christian life. Walking in him. Being established in him. And maturing in Christ, walking in Christ, being in Christ is nothing short of the core and bulk of the Christian life day by day. Every Christian is to become a little Christ. The whole purpose of becoming a Christian is simply nothing else. That's it. That's the thing we're to focus on. But someone hearing all this, hearing what they're supposed to do, and thinking about that, might wonder, why? Why ought I to do this? I mean, I've, I've been saved, whatever that means, and I get to go to heaven, whatever that means. Aren't I good? Like, why should I bother about this maturing in Christ and all of these other things? I think I'm good. Years ago, when Laura and I moved into our apartment, we met a man named Ed. And Ed is a wonderful fellow. He's very pleasant to be around. He makes friends of all of his neighbors. He's got a dog named after Wrigley Stadium. Huge Cubs fan. But as we were chatting and getting to know each other years ago, it came out that he was the owner of a skate rink nearby. And I was like, oh. Uh, at the time, Greg and I were co-leading the team group. And I said, I've got this group of high schoolers at the church. We would love to come to your skating rink. And he said, I would love to have you. Let me give you some vouchers for a discounted price. Let me know when you guys are coming. So I was like, that's great. So we set up a time and a date. Everyone could go. I got the vouchers. We went to the skating rink. We paid our discounted group fee. We got in. It was a great time. Everyone got their skates, and I sat down with the coats and read some articles. So play by play. I organized this thing with Ed. It's the winter. I walked through. Remember that season when it was like negative 20 degrees? I walked through that storm to his apartment to get the vouchers with my wife. I thought it was fun. She did not. And we organized a date to go. We paid our money, got inside. People got their skates, and I proceeded to just sit down with the coats and read an article. And this kid, who I had never met before, skates right up to my table and sits down and stares at me with this narrow examining glance and exclaims, why are you going to pay to come in here if you're not going to skate? It's a valid question. And I think the heart behind that question would be my response to this one. Wait a minute, why are you going to take all the trouble to put on the Christ life if you're not going to engage in it? Why would you enter into this great thing if you're not going to take advantage of anything that's here? And that's kind of Paul's tone. Whenever he runs into this problem in his letters or objection, people ask, why should I? He says, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you engage in all that the Christ has given you in life? Hey, uh, what fruit were you getting at the time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. The fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. Hey, like those other things, they have fruit, but like this fruit is clearly better. Why wouldn't you engage and invest and grow in the things that produce fruit that leads to abundant 
thriving life in Christ. And Paul knew what he was talking about from experience. Before he came to Christ, remember, he was on a fast track to become one of the greatest Pharisees of his day. He was well studied in Scripture. He knew the Torah very well. He had studied at the feet of one of the greatest teachers in the land, had a great reputation among the Jews, was persecuting the Christians on behalf of the synagogues. He was set, and he gave all of it up, all of it, because he encountered Christ and discovered experientially that living in Christ was so much better than what he had been doing before. Not that there was not merit in study or being a good student of the Word or being disciplined, but he realized, hey, this life that I found in Christ, I'm going to put all my chips on that. I'm going to invest everything in that. I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. There's that language again, in him. I will do whatever it takes to be in Christ, to live in him, walk in him, be found in him. That's Paul's attitude. He'll do whatever it takes. And if you read his journey, his accounts about him, he suffers quite a bit, and he's quite content to suffer it. The generation after Paul, so we have the apostles, initial disciples, generation two, church, here we go, we're getting out of the gate. There's a man named Polycarp, and he's a direct student of John, probably also knew Peter and Paul as well. And Polycarp, during a time of intense persecution in the church, became a pillar of the faith. He was a church leader, a shepherd, who many looked up to. And if you read his writings, you see the heart of Christ pouring out of his words to the flock. One day, however, the Romans catch up to him. And he's put before a proconsul to be executed for being a Christian. He's asked, hey, repent of what you believe, proclaim that Caesar is great, and say everyone else should go away. And he and this proconsul have a conversation. There's a book called The Martyrdom of Polycarp. And it's very fascinating and heartwarming to read his faith and what he stood for at the end. And I just wanted to pull some excerpts here for you this morning. We won't read the whole book, of course. But I could. Um, so here's some conversations he's having. The proconsul pressed him and said, Take the oath, and I let you go. Revile Christ. Polycarp said, For eighty and six years has I been his servant. And he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? But he persisted again and said, Swear, by the genius of Caesar. He answered him, If you vainly suppose that I will swear by the genius of Caesar, as you say, and pretend that you are ignorant of who I am, listen plainly. I am a Christian. And if you wish to learn the doctrine of Christianity, fix a day and listen. And the proconsul said, I have wild beasts. I will deliver you to them unless you repent. And he said, call for them. For repentance from better to worse is not allowed us. But it is good to change from evil to righteousness. And he said again to him, I will cause you to be consumed by fire if you despise the beasts unless you repent. But Polycarp said, you threaten with the fire that burns for a time and is quickly quenched. For you do not know the fire which awaits the wicked in judgment to come and in everlasting punishment. But why are you waiting? Come, do what you will. And the proconsul gives him to the crowd and they execute him. The Christians mourn his death, rejoice in his life, give an account of what he suffered for Christ, and in closing say, Thus or such was the lot of blessed Polycarp who though he was together from Philadelphia, the twelfth martyr in Smyrna, is alone, especially remembered by all, so that he is spoken of in every place, even by the heathen. And the point is not necessarily the martyrdom, though that is key to his life in Christ, is his death in Christ, but that he counted, even in his last moments, that being found in Christ was worth everything. Both Christian and non-Christian saw in him he had something rich that he was unwilling to give up. The proconsul pressed him like, all you have to do is just 
repent, say that Caesar's great and I'll let you go. And he wouldn't. He's like, why would I give that up? Why would I go back? He said, it is not permitted to us to repent from something that's better to something that's worse. And I know what you're asking me to do is worse. Why would I go back now that I've been found in him and I'm living that out? And that idea of being in him to the gospel, the New Testament writers, is so key, especially to John. It shows up in a lot of his writings, John, 1 John, 2 John, even some bits of Revelation, the idea of being found in Christ, abiding in Christ. There's a lot of passages where he talks about what that means, but this is probably the one that's the most recognizable to Christians in John 15, the last supper discourse between Jesus and his disciples. Jesus says, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, Neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he that is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. And Jesus gives this idea, this composite picture, that abiding is this mixture and dance between loving the Lord and focusing on Him and keeping His commandments and loving the church. And by doing those things, you abide in His love. And the more you abide in His love, the more you keep His commandments and keep your gaze fixed on Him. Being in Christ in this way is, again, you see that same language here in the Colossians verse we were sitting on this morning. That idea of the nature nurture language of the vine and the branches. As you walk in him, be rooted and built up in him. You find your center in Christ like a branch on a vine, like a plant in the soil. And that concept is so critical to the New Testament authors that they often will contrast being in Christ and not being in Christ with being dead versus being alive, or being asleep, versus being awake. When we do things in the Christian life, like pray, or read, or gather together and sing songs, or take communion, we're not doing those things because we have to do them, or because we're supposed to do them. But historically, we believe that there is a person on the other end of those interactions, the person of the Christ, the man, the God who sits at the center of our faith, and in Him, being in Him, connecting with Him, is where true life is found. It's where this faith is lived to its fullest. To abide in Christ, to live out the Christ life that He's put in us, is at the center of what we believe. And we can know that, and we can live that, but sometimes it's hard to keep our eyes fixed on it, day by day. We can be distracted. We can feel it's not worth it. Sometimes we won't fully comprehend what Christ has invited us into. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink, and sex, and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by a holiday at sea. we should be pursuing that holiday at sea. Even though there are moments when we don't fully understand what the next step is, what that is, we need to keep our eyes fixed on the life that Christ has called us into, where the richness of his glory is. Even when we have those moments where we're fixed and say, I want that holiday. I'm tired of making mud pies. This life is not for me. I know I have Christ. I want to live that way. How do I do that? Right? Sometimes it's a little bit of an ask. Like, yes, I would like to be like the most ideal human being in the species. How do I do that? Right? And we have lots of examples and instruction in Scripture. But that's what this series, this last few weeks, have been about. A focused life. And the pastors have been walking through different angles to approach the day-by-day -day struggles 
to keep our focus fixed on what matters. And they have given excellent advice. And I want to just kind of tie the series off by adding some ideas to it. What are ways that we can keep our eyes fixed on Him? How do we, I don't know, keep, make our way toward into, I guess, the most ideal human being, a God, the God, Christ, who are, we are not just called to be like, but be inside in a spiritual way. Think about this. Can you imagine yourself in 10 years if instead of avoiding all the things you know you should do, you actually did them every single day? What would that be like? What kind of person would you be? And there are things you know you should do. Like, I'm thinking of them right now. I know I should do those things. But if I did them every day, what kind of man would I be in 10 years? And I think the key to this idea is that last sentence. Every single day. Because the, the idea of pursuing Christ and being in Him when it feels daunting is made a little less so if we make our goals more reasonable, more tangible, realistic, and small. If we shrink them down to something we can actually do today. So what are some habits, rather than just the formula we saw at the beginning, what are some habits of the heart we can practice that keep us in line with Christ? First, practice thankfulness. It sounds like something you would see on a Hallmark greeting card. But it's actually very essential to the faith. A couple things happen when you're thankful. One, you acknowledge that there is a being that exists other than you, and that's really important. Two, you put yourself in a place where you are in debt to that being. And whether that's a human being or God, it starts to put yourself in right relation in the Christian walk. So whenever you're thankful to God for anything, it immediately orients yourself as it should be in a human-God relationship. You are God. Anything I good have that's good comes from you. I thank you so much. And it puts you in a direct place where your eyes are fixed on Him for all of your blessings day by day. And this is something the Lord wants at the depth of our connection to Him. In Psalm 50, yes, 50. He says, hey, offer to me a sacrifice or offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High. This comes in the context where he's, he's saying to Israel, I actually, secret, I don't really care about your lamb and your ram and your bull offerings. I don't care about your sin offerings. The thing I want you to sacrifice to me is thankfulness. I want your heart because that's where it goes when you're thankful to the Lord for just the little things every day. Man, I'm thankful this morning, man. This morning, we woke up really early, and I couldn't fall back asleep. It was really hard. But I laid there, and I'm like, Lord, I'm thankful that I get to be in this apartment. I'm thankful that I get to have a calm, quiet night, even if I'm awake. I'm thankful that this bed is warm. I'm thankful that I get to go to church tomorrow. And I just started being thankful, and it put me in a much better mood, even though I couldn't fall back asleep. In the same Colossians verse we were looking at, it sneaks its way in there, Right? rooted, built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in what? Thanksgiving, right? This shows up all over exhortations to the church from all of the authors in the New Testament. Be thankful, be thankful, be thankful, be thankful, be thankful. You will probably not be able to make it through most of the New Testament without running through that word. Practice thankfulness. Second thing, imitate mature believers. We have Christ's instructions. We have his life and the new covenant. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But it can be hard sometimes to imitate him, right? Because it's so scaled up. He's a person, he's a man, and he's here, but he's not here in the same way that like my brother is or my spouse or my friend. And he's over there somewhere. And I, I want to follow him, and I will. But how do I imitate Christ? And one of the stair steps you can do to do that is to find mature Christians and imitate them. Who are the people in your faith community, in your school, in your workplace, who you go, that's a man or woman of the faith I would like to be like someday. What are the habits they're practicing? And I'll practice those too. That's a direct ask from Paul several times in the New Testament. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Here I am imitating Christ. I want you to watch the things I do, the things that are successful, and I want you to do them. And then you will be imitating Christ as well. It's that simple. That's one of the reasons why 
leadership structures are the way they are in the churches. Pastors, shepherds are there partially to provide a character to emulate. Here is a mature Christian who has an intimate relationship with God. Consider the way of their life and imitate their faith. Hebrews 13 says as much. Remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the way of life and imitate their faith. Watch what they do. Look how they love the Lord and follow them. Find mature believers in your own life who you would like to follow. Meet with them. Watch them. And just kind of absorb like what's good that they're doing. When I was in high school, the, the gentleman who taught our high school uh, Sunday school class in my church, his name was Keith. And Keith was a really smart Christian. I wanted to be like him. He's actually what inspired uh, questions from the box from our small group, because he did that with my high school. And I'm like, I want to do that. So I did it with our high school group. And I was always impressed that whatever the question was, because he never knew what was coming, he always would go, let's flip through this part of the Bible. And he just knew where the answer was. I'm like, I want to be like that. I want to be the type of believer who knows how to answer questions in the faith. What are the habits I need to do? And that was a good question for me to ask as a high schooler. It oriented some of the ways that I engaged with the faith. Last thing, do the next good thing. I think we just had a poem a few weeks ago that was along these lines, do the next good thing. And... What does that mean? Like, is it the next best thing, like second best thing, or like I'll settle? No, it means like, hey, if you can't see how you achieve the overarching master plan, what's like the step that's right in front of you? How do you do that thing? That's the next good thing. So C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity, as if I haven't quoted him enough this morning, in his chapter on charity says, hey, the cool thing about Christian charity is that like the world, like they're nice to people because they like them. But Christian charity, we're supposed to be doing things for people even if we don't like them. And if we find that we do that charity, we find ourselves liking the people more and more as we do charitable things for them. And he takes that concept of growing in love for people and scales it up to our relationship with God. And he says, hey, some writers also use the word charity to describe not only Christian love between human beings, but also God's love for man and man love for God. About the second of these two, people are often worried. They are told they ought to love God. They cannot find such feelings in themselves. This is very common. I run into this a lot, even today. You've probably run into it in your own walk. God is great. We're supposed to love him. He's the creator, but he's also, he's not like someone that I have a loving relationship with now, as a person, a human being, in the same way. And I, I can't see God. I can't touch him in the same way, but I want to love him. But I'm having I'm having trouble getting the gumption. Like, how do I do that? C.S. Lewis asks, well, what are they to do? The answer is the same as before with people. Act as if you did. Do not sit trying to manufacture feelings. Ask yourself, if I was sure that I loved God, what would I do? When you have found the answer, go and do it. And so it's a great exercise that you can do at any point in your Christian walk. Immature believer, mature believer, baby Christian, older Christian. Where am I right now? Where am I right now in my walk with God, in being in Christ? I think I'm here, and I'm doing this. But if I was sure that I was the type of person who loved God this much, what would I do? I'm pretty sure I would do this thing. When you figured it out, just start doing that thing. And as you do that, you'll find you become the type of person who loves God that much. Do the next good thing, the next small step. And these are things we have to be intentional with day by day. Just like, you know, the daily bread that comes up in the Lord's Prayer, we mentioned that during this series too. That comes from that episode of the manna in the wilderness. The bread was provided day by day, and if you didn't get bread that day, it was gone. The daily bread, the daily habits have to be practiced all the time regularly, just like when we eat. We really can't, like, come to church on any given Sunday and go, whoa, man, that was a great sermon. I feel like I'm good for, like, the next 10 days. I don't need to eat anything spiritual. That got me through. It doesn't really work that way. We grow in Christ, mature in Christ, when we're practicing these daily habits of connection to Him. And you have to be intentional about it, because your free time is a very precious commodity. There are 
thousands of companies out there that are actively coming for every second of your free time. Because every moment that you're not scrolling your phone is when you could be, and they're selling you ads. And that is, man, it's embarrassing, the amount of time I scroll on my phone doing nothing, but having ads targeted for me. And sometimes they're really crazy. Like, what? I was just talking about this. I didn't even look for it. But there are really, there really are. Like, your free time is not going to just remain in limbo. Someone's going to try and steal it from you if you're not careful with that precious time. Daily habits, a daily heart posture that wants to be connected to God. Because that is sometimes the only thing that's going to get you through that barrage of forces that are vying for all of your free time. What if we took Peterson's question from the beginning of that segment? We modified it a little bit, made it more applicable to us. What kind of Christian do I want to be in 10 years? More personal still, what do I want my connection to Christ to be like in 10 years? Five years? This year? This week? Take some time now to reflect on that. I want to allow some space to just consider that. What would that look like? Remember that imagine yourself? What would, what would that look like if you're like, hey, I think that's where I want to be with Christ this week, this year. This is the type of person in him I want to be. How would I do that? Just take some time to think about what do you want your connection with Christ to be like 10 years, 5 years, this year, this week. As we get ready to close this morning, this series, again, I want to challenge you with these habits and all the habits that the pastors have been sharing the last few weeks. Really consider, how do I want to grow in Christ? And why am I not in certain areas? To live out the Christ life in us is a rich and rewarding experience. And it lies at the core of our connection to God. To not do it is missing out on quite a lot. And there's a lot of times in my life where people give me advice, and I go, yeah, I'll take care of that. And then I do much later, and I go, why didn't I do that sooner? Today, now is the time to just take a next step. How do I want to be awake and alive in Christ? And you to consider these habits. I'm going to close just by reading out of order. The passage in Ephesians 5 we've kind of been leaning on this series. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. May that be our thought and challenge and encouragement as we go into this week. Let me pray for our time. Lord, I thank you so much that we have a life in you. 
that we can abide in you as you abide in us and share in that love that you have with the Father. Sanctify us in your truth, O Lord. Help us to keep your commandments. Abide in your love, to love the body, practice thankfulness, to set our hearts up in a daily heart posture that longs to connect with you and be in you and be found in you, as Paul would say. Help us to encourage each other as the body of Christ to do this very thing, to live out this life we've been given of freedom and to share it with others. In your precious son's name, Jesus, who is the Christ, we pray these things. Amen. Chris, practice thankfulness. That was, that was a good focal point, and especially this, from this past week. Let's all stand. We're going to sing a couple more songs.
Christ. Hey, I'm sorry. Let's try this again in the right key. <laughs> I know there was something I was supposed to do. Thank you for joining us here this morning, and uh, thank you, Chris, for that inspiring message there this morning. Go in peace. <laughs>